If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 15 this morning, you can find it in the Pew Bible in front of you on page 874, and I do encourage you to have God's Word open to you so that you would see that these things are from Him. We'll read verses 1 through 10 this morning of Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what a woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word, you may be seated. Recently, we had one of our pets microchipped a service that our county was putting on, our county's animal rescue, so that if the little fur ball got lost, they would be able to scan the microchip and therefore know who they belong to. I might have joked with my wife and kids that I intentionally gave them a different address so that if they got mistakenly lost, they might find another loving home that would adopt them. I didn't do that, of course, but little did I know that when I signed up for this service that I was also signing up to receive emails of pets in my area that are lost. These have you seen, be on the lookout for emails, complete with pictures and names of the pets, last seen and where. It's uh, essentially a digital lost and found poster. That's sent to my email box. And whereas this might be a good idea, I imagine that most of those emails either don't get opened or that they are quickly forgotten. That people receive it and then either delete it or at best look at it with indifference. Why? Because it's not their cat, it's not their dog. But if it was your cat, or if it was your dog, or if it was your bird, or your hamster, or whatever little pet that you have, you'd feel quite differently, wouldn't you? Because there is a deep connection to these little creatures that live in our homes. The difference, I would say to you, comes as a result of a connection, or lack thereof, to the thing that is lost. As we come to this passage this morning, the Pharisees looked on the things that were lost, the people that were lost, with indifference, with even hardness, saw those that were outside of themselves as those with no hope of being rescued, redeemed, or saved. As a result, they were largely apathetic to them. But we see through these teachings of Jesus, these parables, that Jesus had a very different perspective, that there was a deep connection to the people that were lost, a love for the lost, and as a result, a a great joy, a great rejoicing when they were found, when they were saved. And what we have before us this morning is perhaps the most famous of parables, of all of Jesus' parables, but specifically of the parables in the book of Luke. There are, in fact, three parables here in 
chapter 15, that of the lost sheep, that of the lost coin, and as we'll see next week, that of the lost son or the prodigal son. But they all make one essential message. Something was lost, and now it is found. And there is a rejoicing as a result of the lost being found. And so today we will look at the first of these two parables in three points. Quite simply, lost, found, and rejoice. First, lost. As I mentioned, chapter 15 has these three parables, but notice what Jesus says when he begins telling these parables. It says in verse 3, so he told them this parable. See, Jesus saw this as not three separate parables, but essentially one parable, three in one as it were. And therefore, there is a unifying theme throughout. And the first theme that is very prevalent is that of being lost. We see that very clearly, don't we? A lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son. And why is there such a prevalent theme, that of being lost? lost. Well, again, I think the context here is helpful. It helps us to rightly interpret this parable. You see in verse 1, Luke tells us that the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. That can't be missed. If you remember, it's been two weeks because of our guest speaker, preacher last week since we've been in the Gospel of Luke, but if you remember the previous teachings from chapter 14, then you will remember that chapter 14 is a very difficult teaching. Not difficult to understand or to interpret, but difficult to hear. You remember what Jesus says throughout the chapter, but specifically at the end, is that Jesus says, if you want to follow him, you must have an exclusive love, denying even hating in comparison to other loves. You must even hate one's own life. As a result, you must bear one's cross. Jesus was calling and is calling for a complete denial and death, saying if you are not willing, you cannot be my Disciple, as we said, that is a hard truth if you understand it and what Jesus is saying. He's saying that there must be a complete and utter dedication to him. And as a result, you would think most would be saying, those that heard Jesus then, those that hear Jesus now, I want nothing to do with that. That is too much. That is too great. The cost is too high. But the reality is the opposite was taking place, isn't it? Why is that? Well, I think it's because the greater the cost, the greater the worth of what is received. Or the greater the cost, the the higher the expectations there are. Isn't that true? If you pay a lot of money for something, you expect to, to get a lot out of it. If it costs you nothing, you ultimately value it as nothing. If it costs more, you value it more. If it costs everything, then you see it as everything. And I think that is in part why Jesus does this, is because the gospel is something that we are to to value. And as a result of valuing it, we see its worth. Jesus does not wholesale or bottom shelf the gospel No, he tells it truthfully. He tells us that it will cost us everything, but through it, everything is gained. Do you understand that? That indeed it will cost your life, but in costing your life, you actually gain true life. You gain everlasting life. You gain abundant life. And we see that the tax collectors and the sinners those that were the most desperate found this teaching to be the most appealing. 
It's similar to what I heard during General Assembly, that I heard that there was a PCA pastor's wife that just recently went under an experimental surgery. This surgery that took 12 hours to complete. And you would ask, why would anyone agree to that? I'll tell you why they would agree to it. She had stage four colon cancer. You would never agree to that type of surgery if you just had a cold, would you? But when you are desperate, you'll go to any cost, won't you? And so we see here that the the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near. They were willing to pay their price because they were finding in Jesus what they were so desperate to find. They were finding the hope that they were looking for. But we notice, in contrast, that not all saw Jesus this way. Not all heard Jesus' teaching with this same ear and with this same desire, even with this same desperation, because we see in verse 2 that the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. They were not excited. They were not enthused, first and foremost, of Jesus, but even more so that these outsiders, these tax collectors and sinners, were being welcomed. They were being received. They had receptivity with Jesus for Jesus to accept them and and not spur them like they did or or tell them to go away and clean themselves up and then perhaps come and then they would be acceptable. And so as a result, the Pharisees, the scribes, were making Jesus as equally guilty as these sinners and tax collectors that he was associating with. It was guilt by association. The scribes and the Pharisees thought of themselves as as pure, and therefore they only associated with those that were like them, those that in their mind were also pure. They never imagined defiling themselves with these lowlifes as they would have saw them. So they snubbed them, or anyone like them that was not on the same level as they were. And as a result, they grumbled. Do you see that word there in verse 2? Does that sound familiar to you? It ought to. That word is used, the same word is used throughout the Greek translation of the Old Testament for what the Israelites did in the wilderness. They complained and they grumbled. If you've ever read through the Bible and if you've ever read through the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, then you'll read this again and again. In fact, I would say it's the the theme of the book of Numbers. I often like to say that the the book of Numbers is God numbering his people and the people numbering their problems and their complaints with God. They complained about everything. They, They complained about the travel. They complained about the food. They complained about the desert. It might sound like summer break in your home with your children, but God does not look kindly upon complaining and grumbling. Why? Because it is a soft form of rebellion. As if all things, the world and everything in it, needs to be catered to my likes and my wants, and when they're not, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to voice them and complain about them. But that is not reality, is it? Why? Because we are not God. The world does not revolve around us. And so what happened in the wilderness With Israel, well, that grumbling, that complaining turned into something even greater. It turned into idolatry, didn't it? Their grumbling and their complaining led down the path of idolatry, of building and making this golden calf and worshiping at its feet. We must understand where sin leads us. That's why children, youth, let me speak to you. Do you complain? Do you grumble? You need to understand that where that comes from. It comes from a, a prideful heart that I want it my way right away. And if I don't, then I'll let you know. I'll let everyone know. And we need to know that as adults as well, parents, about our own grumbling, our own complaining. We need to know that with our children. And we are not to 
tolerate grumbling and complaining. Why? Because it, it leads down the path of idolatry. Am I overstating things? No, I don't think I am. Why? Because we start to get into this mentality that if, if I don't get the things that I want, then I'm going to create a reality where I do get those things. As a result, I'm going to create a reality of another God. God hasn't given me what I need, and so I'm going to, therefore, create what I need. I'm going to create my own God, my own reality where my needs are fulfilled. I think that's what we see in our culture altogether, isn't it? We've abandoned what God has said is good and said, no, this is really what is good. I'll take this instead. It's idolatry, isn't it? But we need to know that we are never satisfied apart from God. We'll never be content. We'll never be complete apart from him because we are created for the one true God. And so no other false gods will do. As Augustine so famously put it, our hearts are restless until they find our rest in you, O God. And so when we see this word grumbling, that should be a flashing neon light warning. Here are people that are rebelling against God and against the ways of God, and they're creating their own God, their own worship. I think that's a fair summary of the Pharisees as a whole. And as a result... They did not recognize their own lostness, did they? Let me ask you, do you? Do you see that there is a, a great divide, a great difference between how the tax collectors and sinners looked upon Jesus and how the Pharisees and the scribes looked upon Jesus? And it all became as a result of how they saw themselves and how they saw their situation. And so, which of those two groups depict us? How do we come this morning even to worship? Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm glad that you are here. But the way that you come, the way that you approach will determine what you receive, won't you? And this is all determined by how you see yourself. If you think, you know, I, I got it pretty well put together. I might have a few rough edges here and there that can be smoothed out. Jesus might help with that. It might polish me up a little bit. Put a little shine on my already put together life. If that's your perspective, if that's how you come. And let me tell you, you have not plummeted the depths of your own depravity. You haven't recognized how desperate your situation truly is. Because my friends, before we look at this parable, before we look at these three parables, you have to understand when Jesus talks about this lost sheep, this lost coin, this lost son, he's not talking about some abstract, something outside of ourselves. He's talking about you and me, isn't he? Because my friends, we... Without Christ, are lost. We are lost, lost. As one of my friends used to say, we're lost as an Easter egg with no hope of being found. No other rescue, no other way of redemption. We use this in our, our membership vows. If you're a member, you have taken this vow, and I think I need to remind you of it. The first vow, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God. But it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just say, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner? It goes on to say that you justly deserve his displeasure, that you should not receive anything good from God. And then it lastly says, and you are without hope, except in his sovereign mercy. Let me ask you, is that how you see your place your position in this life that without Christ you are without hope if you don't then you don't know the depths of your own lostness is there that sense of desperation in your own soul that there is only one way there is only one hope 
And it is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. I would propose to you, it all depends on how you see your own spiritual diagnosis. Spiritually speaking, do you see yourself as at stage four cancer? Or do you see yourself as just merely having a cold? Because how you see that is how desperate you will be to pursue Christ and to know the only hope is in him alone. And the reality is it's not that we're just even sick, not even stage four sick. The reality is the scripture tells us that we're dead. We're dead in our sins and our transgressions. And I would say to you, a corpse can't ask, hey, what are my options? What are my choices? What are my possibilities? No, a corpse only needs one thing and one thing alone. It needs life. And that life is Christ. Christ is our life. Well, second, we see this aspect of being found. Jesus' main point in this passage, and we'll see it even more next week, is to demonstrate to the Pharisees that they are lost, if not more so than the tax collectors and the sinners that they scorn. And what I find amazing about this parable is that even though Jesus appears to speak harshly to them in chapter 14, which I would say to you, reality is he just speaks to them the truth, that chapter 15 demonstrates that he does not give up on them. That these parables are a plea to the Pharisees. That these parables are a plea to his own covenant people to come home, to recognize who he is and what mission he was sent on from his father. And we ought not miss that. We ought not miss that because the same is for us. The same is us for us as as covenant people. Those that have been brought into covenant by baptism, we must embrace the realities of the covenant. We must embrace the fulfillment of the covenant, which is Christ. You see, the, the Pharisees, the Jews were not doing that. They were rejecting Christ. They were rejecting the realities of the covenant. I would say to you, it's the same thing for any good church going person or any youth group, Sunday school going child. That if we only come to church and and miss the realities of Christ, then we've missed it all, haven't we? Because it's always about Christ. It's all points to Christ. All roads, as they say, lead to, to Rome, or perhaps in our context, all roads lead to Atlanta. Same way, all scriptures, all covenant realities, all covenant promises must lead us to Christ, who is the way, the truth in the life. But here's the amazing reality of the gospel. It's not as though God remains as a stationary object and we must find our way back to him. No, that which is lost cannot be found on its own. We see that especially in these parables. We see it especially with the first of these Two parables that Jesus chooses, you see that there is a lost sheep and a man having a hundred sheep lost one of them. Now sheep might be fluffy and they might be cute and we might all enjoy when our children make those little cotton ball pictures of them in Sunday school and bring them home to us. But sheep in reality are pathetic animals. They cannot fight, they have no claws, they have no sharp teeth, they don't even have a a beak to peck. They cannot flee, they don't possess the speed like a, a deer or a gazelle. They cannot fly like a bird. They cannot find their own way home. They lack the instincts and sensory receptors to navigate their, their way back home. As one commentator puts it, a sheep is destitute both of the instinct necessary to find its way and of every weapon of self-defense. It is prey to any beast which may meet it. In other words, a, a lost sheep in the wild is a good breakfast, lunch, or dinner for some predator. It is lamb chops, as it were. There is no hope 
for a lost sheep unless there's one that pursues after it, unless there is one that has its good at heart. And notice that is exactly what this parable teaches us, that there is this shepherd that goes to find the lost sheep. It's the shepherd that pursues after the sheep, not the other way around. And Jesus, obviously, in telling this parable, is referring to himself that he is the shepherd that pursues after the lost sheep. He himself is the good shepherd. This parable has the echoes of Psalm 23 all over it, that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, and I shall not want because he is my protector, he is my provider, he is my defender, he is my redeemer. Jesus is our shepherd. And as our shepherd, he pursues and finds the lost sheep. And the second parable is like it, that the lost coin is even less likely to be found than a lost sheep, isn't it? At least a, a sheep might be able to, to cry out, might be able to, to bleat, but a coin can make no sound or noise. It will remain in the exact spot where it is dropped until something or someone finds it. And yet, what do we read in that parable? That the woman that lost the coin puts in tremendous effort to find the lost coin. She lights a lamp. She sweeps not just one area, but the whole house. She does not rest until it is found. So too the, the work of God. In a, a world where every religion says that you must find your way, you must find God, you must ascend to heaven or, or to nirvana or whatever their goal is at the very end of the line or the very top of the ladder, Christianity is the only religion, the only religion that says God doesn't tell us to come to him, he comes to us. That we do not ascend, but rather he descends to seek and to save the lost. And Jesus does not come, was not sent on a fool's errand. He seeks and finds what is his, what is lost. Notice that, don't you? How many sheep did the shepherd have? The shepherd had 100 sheep. How many were lost? 50? 10? 5? 2? No, just, just one. One lost sheep. And the shepherd didn't go, well, you know what? You win some, you lose some. I wish it well. I hope it finds its way home. Good thing I still have 99 others. No, he pursues after the lost sheep. Same with the, the lost coin. It's just one coin. What is just one coin? You still have plenty. No. Finds the lost coin. And Jesus will not stop until all are his we read that in John 10, 27, don't we? My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hands. Maybe some of you this day need to recognize your own lostness. And this is the day through the preaching of this word that the whole power of the Holy Spirit would reach you and know that you are found, that you are the, the lost sheep that is strayed. You are the lost coin that has fallen, and it's time to be found. And Christ, as the good shepherd, Christ as the redeemer, as the savior that has come to seek and to save the lost, will find you this day in this place and be ready to, to carry you home upon his shoulders. It's such a beautiful picture, isn't it? When this lost sheep is found, it says that he lays it on his shoulders and brings it home. And the same will take place, spiritually speaking, this day to any that are lost, that you would be found. 
And this passage ought to be an encouragement to you parents or to you grandparents that have covenant children, that have left the blessings of the covenant, that have left the church behind to pursue what the world would have to offer. And they are very much like this lost sheep. They are very much like this lost coin. Would you plead the covenant promises of God for them? Would you plead the promises of their baptism if they've indeed been baptized? That the good shepherd would find their lost sheep, his lost sheep, that lost son or daughter or grandson or or granddaughter and would bring them back into the flock of God, that he would light a lamp, that he would sweep and he would find them. That they would know that their only true value, their only value is with God. In a world where they will be spent and, and will be spent, that only in God do they have true treasure and are treasured. Would the Lord be pleased to, to do his work of seeking and saving the lost? And, and would we, as a church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, be a part of that work? That the, the Lord uses means, doesn't he? That we don't just hope and pray, but that there would be a pursuit, a desiring as well, to seek and to save the lost, a work that we cannot do on our own, but Christ can do through us. And so let me ask, when you look at the world, when you look out and and see what's taking place in our day and age, how do you see the world? Do you just grumble and complain? Are you like the Pharisees and say, you know what, I wish they would get it together. I wish they would clean themselves up, find their way home. Let me ask you, is that how you made your way home? Is that who you were before the grace of God found you? It's the good shepherd that found us while we were lost and while we were straying. And would we have that same heart for those that are lost? It's easy for us, and I say this as your pastor, it's easy for us to become insulated, isn't it? I was struck by that recently when I went and and traveled. Admittedly, I oftentimes don't get out from my church bubble. I don't travel much. But when you travel, you see the world, don't you? When you see that it's a lost world. And it's a burden, and it ought to be a burden. That the Lord would would continue to, to burden our hearts for the lost, for the lost sheep for the lost coin, that we never stop pursuing, we never stop lighting a lamp, the lamp of God's word, and sweeping until all are found, because that is the heart of our Savior, and hopefully that would be our heart as well. Well, third, not only do we see the lost found, but we see this aspect of rejoice, rejoicing. We can't miss it, can we? It's a repeated theme throughout these parables, we see that when the lost sheep is found, the shepherd rejoices and in fact calls others together to rejoice with him, the same with the lost coin. She says in verse nine, rejoice with me for I've found the coin that I have Lost, there is a joy, there is a gladness, there is a happiness when the lost is found. And all of us know this on a, a small basis and sometimes on a great basis. Sometimes when we misplace things and then when you find it, it brings joy, it brings happiness. This happens to me all the time because I misplace things constantly. My wife will tell you I'm helpless, much like a sheep. I am misplacing things constantly. And if it wasn't for the help of my wife and my kids and and Pastor Myers, oftentimes all my stuff would be lost. But on the plus side, it gives me multiple opportunities to rejoice when these things are found again. But on a much greater, better, much greater level, if you've ever lost a child for even a a moment, just for a slight second, you you look and they're not where they, you thought they would be, and then you know 
much greater degree that when they are found, what relief that brings, what joy that gives us. I'll never forget our church in California had a family camp and there was a four-year-old girl that went missing from the camp and no one knew where she was. Didn't know she was lost, she'd been abducted, if she had been hurt, if she had drowned, no idea. And they had to call in the rescue team. It was the, the worst nightmare of a situation. And they searched and searched and could not find her and Finally, night fell, and they had to call off the search until the morning. I'll never forget it. It was the most awful feeling. But praise God, she was found the next day. And not only found, but she was alive and and well. She was found through the use of search and rescue dogs. And what went from the, the most terrible situation to the to, to, to the most pure ecstatic praise and rejoicing where there was many tears now of happiness and of joy and of relief. That is what Jesus is saying here. That is what is taking place when the lost are found. You remember, you, you see this theme, in fact, in John chapter four when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman and after she goes away rejoicing, telling all in her town, come and see this man that told me everything that I ever did. Jesus rejoiced because this lost sheep was found. You remember what the disciples did when they came back? And they urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And the disciples, not understanding, said, had someone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. For already the one who receives, reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. Do you notice what he says there, that they may rejoice together? together. You see that in our parable, don't you? That it's not just the shepherd that rejoices, and it's not just the woman that rejoices, but they call others to join in their rejoicing. That they both call others, come rejoice with me, join in my joy. That is church, my friends. What should characterize our attitude, our perspective as the people of God? I would tell you that we ought to be rejoicing people. Yes, we mourn with those that mourn, we weep with those that weep, but the predominant emotion and feeling at all times is joy. Our worship and praise ought to have great rejoicing, even in the midst of the pain and the struggles and the difficulties, because we know that God is even using them for our good. But it is especially sweet, isn't it, when we can join in the overwhelming joy of those that were lost and now are found. I would say to you, that's earth's greatest joy. And those that are saved both from Paul-like Damascus Road conversions to those that are saved like Timothy, who perhaps knew not a day that he did not know the scriptures and have faith in Christ. Because I would say to you, both are conversions that are supernatural and that are worthy of rejoicing in. And we ought to rejoice because that reflects heaven. Did you notice that in verse seven? It says that there is joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And the same in verse 10, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I ask you, how how does Jesus know what the scene is like in heaven? He doesn't know unless he comes from heaven, and of course he has. He is the one that was sent down from heaven. He knows what takes place in heaven when a sinner repents and comes home. And so you see that there's joy on earth, there's joy in heaven, there's God's people rejoicing, there's angels rejoicing. It's what unites heaven and earth together. I'd say it's heaven on earth when we get to enter into this joy and this rejoicing. 
Let me finish with this. It's a true story. It's a story that was told in a monthly devotional called The Daily Bread. You might be familiar with it. And it's a story of a woman named Edith who had no care whatsoever for religion but was utterly discontent. And so finally, in her desperation, she goes to the church near her apartment. And that Sunday, the pastor was reading this passage, the same passage that was before us this morning for the sermon that day. And he read it from the King James Version. And it reads this way, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured together, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. She sat straight up in her pew. <laughs> eateth with them? How did he know that I was going to be here today? She eventually realized her mistake. But the thought that Jesus welcomes sinners, including her, Edith stayed with her. And it was the beginning of her being drawn near to Jesus and Jesus bringing her home. The shepherd this day continues to do the same. He calls his sheep by name and brings them home. For indeed, this man, Jesus, receives sinners and even Edith and you and me with him. Praise God in Jesus. The lost has been found, for I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Join me in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the aspect of being found, not because of any merit or doing of our own, not because of our own efforts, but because of yours and yours alone, because of your work of righteous, because of your work of salvation, because of your work of dying on the cross for sinners like us, Lord, the lost have been found. And as a result, we rejoice. And in that rejoicing, Lord, would we desire to rejoice all the more would we desire to see many more join in in that rejoicing and in that joy that is found in Christ Jesus alone? So would we be a church that desires, like our Savior, to seek and to save the lost? And would you, O oh Lord, be pleased to do your work through us? We pray this all in Christ, our Savior's name. Amen.